So we're going to do a Taylor series review first. And basically to summarize this section, we're going to look at series expansions of functions and then take derivatives of those series and then put them back into the original equation and then look at how we're basically going to match coefficients. Uh, so that's everything in a nutshell, but we'll go through things a lot sl more slowly. So we'll start out with the Taylor series review. I think your calc book used A for the uh, x value you were centered at. And these start at 0, go to infinity. Of course, AK depends on what function that this is a Taylor series expansion of. So it's AK. It changes a lot. Taylor series of, what is the word I'm looking for? Analytic is not it. No, oh, analytic is the word I'm looking for. So this is how the Taylor series looks, and a k should be the kth derivative of f evaluated at a divided by k factorial. And that's not in my notes, but I think I remember that correctly. Does that look right? I know calc 2 was a long time ago. It seems right. It can take a while to compute Taylor series. There is, I think, eight or ten really popular Taylor series that I recommend you write down. I don't know if they're in your Diffie Q book. They probably should be. So if you want to scan through chapter 27, there might be a list, or 37, there may be a list of them in there. Uh, but I know for sure they're in your calc book. Uh, now we need to, well, first of all, what does the word analytic mean? So that's the end of, a tail of what Taylor series is. And analytic is over an interval. This interval might be open, closed, half open, half closed. So I'm just going to write interval. And it could stand for um, any of those four types. So f is analytic if the Taylor series for f of x converges for all x in the interval. So in a nutshell, analytic means it has nice derivatives and you're not including basically any vertical asymptotes. That's pretty much the intuitive definition of an analytic. So most functions we work with are going to be analytic. The only exceptions will be anything that has a vertical asymptote. You don't want to include those x values in your interval. <coughs> and when we look at there's another word, converges. So what does that mean? So this converges we're going to use pretty much exclusively the ratio test. So I'm just going to write converges when it passes a convergence test, of which there's a few different convergence tests. So 
So it can really pass any of the convergence tests, but ratio is the one that's going to be most useful. So I'm just going to go ahead and write that in here. Uh, another one sometimes can be useful. The integral test is good and limit comparison. Those are pretty much the top three. Uh, root is OK if the AK term looks like it has a kth power in it. And then the root, uh, root test will be useful. So not only uh, does it converge, there is one x value it'll always converge for. Oh, and you have to test endpoints. So you have to pass convergence test, find the interval of convergence. And we'll call that uh, R is the radius of convergence. What x value will this guaranteed converge for no matter what? A. So no matter what AK is doing, if A, uh, if x is equal to A, you got a bunch of zeros added together. So always converges for x equal A. The only question is, how far away can we get from A and still get this to converge? So how far away we can get is called the radius right here. So that's how far away we can go either direction. So this will be A plus R and the other one A minus R. So you'll get a radius out of your um, ratio convergence test. And what did we do after we got the radius? So I know how far away I can go. What did we do after that? We had to go and check each endpoint individually to decide is A minus R, does it converge at A minus R? And then does it converge at A plus R? A lot of times you had to do alternating series on one of the two and some other test on the other side. Generally the ratio test will be inconclusive at both endpoints. So the ratio test won't help you find convergence at the endpoints. So the ratio and the root test will be inconclusive at the endpoints. So of course you can't use it. So the next two best tests are the uh, limit comparison, uh, limit comparison, integral test, and alternating series test. Those are pretty much what you're going to use after this. So you need to test both endpoints using one of the three tests, uh, limit comparison test, to integral test, or alternating series. So I don't have time to recap a full week of Calc 2, so I can't go through and talk about each of these tests for 30 or 40 minutes. So I'm just going to refer you back to your book for these, your Calc book. This is all chapter 10 in your Calc book. Pretty sure all these are in the. Uh, pretty sure all these are also in the free calc book that I posted on Canvas. I just haven't looked through what how it's organized, but I'm sure somewhere in there there's a chapter called series. So let's go ahead and ah interval of convergence. So once you test your endpoints. You get what's called the interval of convergence. So this interval can look like 
an open interval, which will look like a minus r, comma a plus r. So it looks like that interval on the upper left, open at the ends. So that's an open, or it could be open on one side, closed on the other. Or it could be open on one side, closed on the other. Or it could be closed on both sides. So this is why you test each endpoint, and then depending pass or fail on each endpoint, you get one of these four options right here. So you should get exactly one. The only time you don't have to check if your r is zero, then there's no. You only can converge at that one value. You don't have to do any more work. But generally, the r is not going to equal zero. So those are, that's one one case. R equals zero. Uh, only this means we only converge at x equals a. Generally, r is going to be between zero and infinity. It'll be a positive value, and that means you have to check endpoints like normal. This is uh, the most common. Probably 90% of the time or more, you'll get a positive R value. And the other chance you could get R is infinity. So what in the world does that mean? Let's think about this real number line. You can go over infinitely, infinitely far to the left, infinitely far to the right. That means I got all numbers it's going to converge for. So my radius is infinitely big. It will converge no matter what x you give me. And I don't have to also check endpoints. So we could write it as, uh, let's see, we wrote it as a minus a minus infinity, a plus infinity, which is a little silly to write. That's just minus infinity and positive infinity. It doesn't matter what a value I used. Could have been zero, could have been a thousand, and it would still be negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, so that's different possibilities for your radius. So let's write down the ratio test. So the normal ratio test, you had to be sure that AK was never 0, because you're about to look at a ratio where it's going to appear as a fraction, and also it can't be negative. So what we're going to do on our ratio test, normally we looked at uh, AK plus 1 over AK. But now you have to include not just AK, but the entire term on the inside. So this was before. So now we have AK plus 1 times x minus a to the k power divided by a k, oops, that should be a k plus 1, and that's the k. So it looks like a k plus 1, you also have that times x minus a to the k plus 1 as well. All right, this fraction won't make sense if the denominator is ever 0. So we need to just write down, um, this is when ak better not be 0. And of course, x, if x equals a, it converges. So you can make the assumption x is not a. So if x equals a, we know this already converges. So you can assume x is not a. Now, the ratio test needs everything to be positive. Of course, x moving a little bit. And let's see, when x is a little bit less than a, then this subtraction will be negative. So it's very easy to get a negative value out of here. So we're going to fix that by putting in absolute values. I'm going to have to worry about if x is going to make it negative. 
So when you do the ratio test, you want to line up similar terms. So I see AK plus 1 over AK. So that's one similar term. And this does, I'll leave the absolute value until the end. How do the second set of terms reduce? X minus A. So we got one more X minus A on the numerator. So it's just X minus A. So absolute value, you can split across a product. Just do both of them at separate absolute values. OK, so that's <coughs> the first computation in the ratio test. And then we let rho equal the limit of this thing. Does x minus a change when k changes? So what I just underlined, that's constant as far as the limit's concerned. It's not constant for x, but it's constant for this limit. So I can bring that out front of the limit. So it'll be rho equals x minus a times lim k approaches infinity. So that's about the as much reduction as we can do. So the ratio test looked at the value of rho, or you could just call it a p. And if this rho is less than 1, it converges. So when this rho is less than 1, it converges. <laughs> So let's just figure out when is rho less than 1. And that's exactly when this will converge. So it's probably enough writing about the ratio test. So let's say that you do this and you get something like a 10 times x minus a is less than 1. So we did some example and we computed and got 10 as our limit right there. So what does that mean about uh, our interval? So I divide by 10. So x minus a is less than a tenth. So absolute values with inequalities, they definitely make my brain hurt. So we either have x minus a is less than 1 tenth. That's if it's positive, we get this. If it's negative, x minus a is, let's see, make it positive. I, if it's positive, you just erase the absolute value signs. If it's negative, you have to make it positive. And if I solve for x minus a, just multiply by negative 1. And let's see, we have negative, whoa, that's negative 1 tenth. There we go. And last step, we'll add a to both sides. So in this form, it should be pretty easy to see what's going on. You are close to A, and you're allowed to go over one-tenth in both directions. Right there. So there's your interval. So the number you get, basically rho is the reciprocal of your radius. 
So that number you get is the reciprocal of your radius. So if you get a big row like 10, that actually means your radius is small one tenth. You still have to go and check those two endpoints individually. So this uh, value you get right here So this is the reciprocal of the radius. <laughs> so that was the last week of Calc 2 in a nutshell, really quickly. Uh, I did talk about checking the two uh, endpoints individually. Generally, one of the endpoints will alternate signs, and that's a really good time to use this alternating series, and the other one generally will not alternate signs, so obviously you can't use alternating series. You'll have to use one of the other tests out there. Uh, instead of doing examples, let's jump right to uh, how do we use series to solve ODEs. This is 37B. Maybe we should do one example. Yeah, let's do one example out of, let me jump back to Calc 2 notes. Let's see if there's a good one at the end. You can always do sine, but sine's kind of boring. Now let's do signs so the derivatives don't get too bad. Now sine x has an in infinite interval of convergence. That's not very exciting. What's that? Probably. Let's see what's in your book. This is 37. I think the only ones that really don't have infinite intervals are functions with vertical asymptotes, but they have really bad derivatives. That's what I'm worried about. It's getting an infinitely bad derivative. Ah, I can think of a function that will have a vertical asymptote and not have horrible derivatives. There we go. 1 over x function. Derivatives aren't so bad. And it has a vertical asymptote. Yeah, that's the best example I come up with off the top of my head. All right, so you have to find the, you can write the zero derivative it is x and negative 1. The first derivative, negative x, negative 2. I don't want to ruin your fun, so find enough derivatives until you see the pattern. I'll give you a hint, there's a factorial inside. You may need to do a couple more terms to see that factorial. So there should be a factorial pattern. I think if you go to the fourth, the fourth derivative, you should see the pattern happening. So once you have that nth pattern, the nth derivative pattern written down, then before you actually apply it, you have to find uh, at evaluate at a, which is 2. So you got to plug in the derivatives at a. Once you figure out the derivative, the nth derivative, you plug in 2 for all those. And then you can scroll up for the, how that fits back in the summation. This is ak that we're looking for, or I guess an right here. Two. 
2 divided by n factorial. That should be the a n coefficient. I know it's been a while, so I'll come around and give you any, a hand on the uh, putting this together. It can be tricky. shouldn't really be too bad once you get there. And I'll give you a hint if you leave your 2 times negative 3 and on the next step down, 2 times 3 times 4, you need the next one, 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, you'll see the factorial right there. you're finding this. Make sure you evaluate your derivatives at 2, you should have no more x's. instantly and thus kind of ignoring those patterns that emerge.
So you should see the basically the factorial pattern and the alternating sign pattern coming out of these numbers right here. And although at the top, uh, 2 times 3 times 4, 2 times 3 times 2, you could put in a times 1. And up here, 0 factorial is defined to be 1. So there is a 0 factorial up there. All right, once you see this, the rest is pretty straightforward. Fn, there's an alternating sign, so it's either negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1. And I like to just guess and check. That's a good uh, strategy to use overall. So this will give me a positive 0 term, a negative 1 term, positive 2 term, negative 3 term. So that alternates on the right, uh, on the odds in this case. And now the, let's see, the actual numbers, we got an n factorial happening there. And x to the, be very careful about this power. Is it 1 minus n, it looks like? So at 4, ooh, it's negative 1 minus n. So at 0, we have negative 1. At 1, we have negative 2. At 2, we have negative 3. <coughs> so again, guess and check. Don't just check 1. You might be right on the first one, and then maybe you add a 1 instead of some, or it, Maybe if I went plus n, I could be right at the 0 term and wrong on all the rest. So check at least 2. And now all we're going to do is plug in 2 in this pattern. So we got, let's see, positive 1 times 0 factorial. Actually, we don't really, we can skip right to this one here, I think. We don't need to waste our time doing that. So we got negative 1 to the n n factorial, and it is important, I need to, where I see x, I'm going to write a 2. This is 2 to the minus 1 minus n divided by n factorial. So those factorials, n factorial, n factorial cancel completely. We got negative 1 to the n power, and let's write this as 1 over 2 to the n plus 1. That looks better for at least the way I like to write <coughs> terms out. I try to keep my powers positive whenever possible. So any questions on a n? You should have no x's in here whatsoever. If you got any x's hanging around, they're going to, in the when I put it in the actual uh, written out series, that's where I get my powers of x but I should have no x's in, in the coefficient part. And if you do, chances are you <laughs> probably had an x where you should have put in your a value. That's the most common error. OK, so our Taylor series. And some books use n, some use k. Hopefully I use n in my notes. X minus regular a to the n power, infinity, so I'm writing an a n, so it's negative 1 to the nth, 2 to the n plus 1, x minus a is 2 to the n. All right. So is our Taylor series. It's definitely going to converge when x equals 2. The question is, how much further out is it going to converge past 2? So before we apply a test, any questions on just the series written down? So there should be, if we go to infinity, this is the 1 over x function right there. Um, obviously, it's not going to work when x equals 0. Certainly, the left side doesn't make any sense when x equals 0. So Right away, the radius is not going to be infinity. It's going to be no more than 2. Because if I go 2 over, I, the left side doesn't make any sense. So let's figure out what the actual radius is. We're going to use the ratio, ratio test. Um, 
let's use, I'm going to jump right down to this version right here. So I'm just going to look at uh, where x minus a is already brought out front. So I'm not going to mess around with reducing those powers and canceling them out. So it just really comes down to this limit right here. So we had our AN right there. I'm just going to copy that AN down at the upper right corner of the board there. Oh. Uh oh. Oh, the factorial is canceled. Good. Okay, so that's our AN. Increasing the n by 1. Now I'm going to multiply. Most of the time, an is going to be a fraction already. So it's better to just start off using the reciprocal instead of writing a fraction of fractions. So the reciprocal of an is negative 1 to the n. And the denominator and the numerator is 2 m plus 1. Okay, so let's arrange terms that are similar. So we're going to have 2n plus 1 over, on the bottom I see 2n plus 2, times negative 1 to the n plus 1 divided by negative 1 to the n power. All right, negative 1 raised to any power is either going to be positive or negative 1, but we're about to absolute value this. So that absolute value doesn't care about the alternating sign part. This actually reduces to negative 1, but the fact that we're absolute valuing this whole thing, that will actually cancel just positive 1. So that completely disappears. It's negative 1, but the absolute value gets rid of it. What about our 2s right here? What does that reduce to? That's just one half. There's one more two on the denominator. And what is this limit? Easiest limit in the world. It's one half. One half. It's always one half. All right. So we got one half times x minus two. And this is rho, and I want rho to be less than one. So this whole quantity has to be less than one. And multiply by 2. So it looks like we have a half, but really we get the reciprocal of that. And we multiply by 2. So there's 2. We can go 2 to the left and 2 to the right. So our radius is 2 and 2. So we saw, it, at least just looking, because of our function being 1 over x, I know for sure two doesn't, uh, 0 is not going to work, but I still need to just be extra sure, so I'll check 0 and I'll check 4 now. So we have for sure from 0 to 4 it works, but the question is, does it work at 0 or does it work at 4? We have every reason to believe it's going to fail at 0, but 4 might be a different story. So we're going to check our endpoints. We'll do x equals 0 first. Somewhere we wrote our, here we go. There's our series. So I'm going to rewrite that, except where I see x, I'm going to put 0. So it's negative 1 to the n over 2 to the n plus 1 times 0 minus 2 
to the end power. So let's reduce this down. Zero minus two is just minus two. So we have negative two to the n. That's negative one times two to the n power. So I can write it as negative one to the n times two to the n, right there. So. Um, what's that? <coughs> Well, so I want to break the negative out of the power, basically, oh, okay. so I can cancel, because I see a negative 1 to the n. So I'm basically, I'm aiming for that. That's why, that was my motivation for this. All right, almost there. Negative 1 to the n, negative 1 to the n. Cancel, because that's always going to be positive, no matter what the value of n is. And we have one more two in the denominator. All right, what happens if you add up an infinite number of halves? Goes to infinity. Goes to infinity. Half as fast as adding up an infinite number of ones, but it still goes up to infinity. So it equals infinity. You can say the uh, nth term test for divergence. The terms don't get any smaller than one half. Oh, that's another one I didn't mention. Nth term test for divergence, if your n terms, if your terms don't get small, it has to diverge. And you also have to check x equals negative, not negative four, positive four, um, separately. So I think you'll get an alternating sum of halves which will either probably be like 0 or 1 or something like that. So we'll look at that tomorrow real quick.